Hi, my name's Nick, and welcome to the Watchmen comic sequel, Doomsday Clock. Normally, I just tell the stories of comic books by describing what's on the page and showing the pages are most important. This is going to be a little different. While I'll assume you've read Watchmen, or at least know the story from the film, I mean, why else watch a sequel story if you haven't heard the first story, I will not assume you have any deep knowledge of the DC Universe into which this story adopts the Watchmen Universe, so I'll be explaining things a bit more than usual. Doomsday Clock's not only a sequel, it's the story of the Watchmen Universe connecting to the DC Universe, and even then, this story doesn't show the DC Universe as it exists anywhere else. This DC Universe will be crossing over into has been manipulated and had its timeline altered by Dr. Manhattan, as will become clear eventually. But I think it'll really help clarify things if you know that going in. It's not a big plot reveal, you're supposed to figure it out from context clues that only longtime DC fans would catch. By the end, it will become the DC Universe proper as of 2018, but you'll see a different history in this book than anywhere else, and John is why. The purpose of this video is to share the story with you so you can compare it to the completely separate TV show sequel. Plenty of people are making videos about that, so I figured I'd do this instead, just so it's out there. Okay, now that's out of the way, let's dive in. The title, Doomsday Clock, refers to the metaphorical clock featured in the original Watchmen and in real life that shows a group of nuclear scientists' opinion of how close the world is to nuclear war, implying that a disaster is coming to the DC Universe as well by the end of this 12-part series. The format is identical to the original, using mostly a nine-panel grid layout, but with a modern art style. The original ended in 1986, and this story begins on October 22, 1992. Rorschach's journal has been published, investigated, and the world is finally coming to believe him, tearing itself apart in response. Someone new has assumed his mantle and costume, and in his journal he writes, November 22nd, 1992, or maybe it's the 23rd. Streets are littered with bodies, brains boil over by grotesque nightmares of a fictional invader. Clocks started over. We had a chance. But they blew it. All of them. The undeplorables scream to hear themselves deafened in their echo chamber, blaming the other side for what they have instead of who they are. Their tolerance is a one-way street. While the totalitarians stand their ground, covering their eyes, preaching for a return to a rose-colored republic, unaware that for those not like them, the good old days weren't so good. Depends on your perspective. God turned his back, left paradise to us, like handing a five-year-old a straight razor. We slid open the world's belly. Secrets came tumbling out. An intestine full of truth and shit strangled us. Soon the bugs will be all that's left, and the cockroaches will go to war with the maggots fighting over the scraps of the moderates. Then they'll eat themselves and finally choke. Unless we bring God back down. Kicking and screaming because maybe we don't deserve it. Maybe the world should burn this time. We shattered the American dream. This is the American nightmare. The news reports show a world falling apart at the seams. A hostage situation has gripped the White House as the White President has shot the Attorney General. The European Union's economy has collapsed and Russia plans to invade. North Korea has a missile that can reach Texas and Americas are flooding across the border into Mexico by the thousands. A global manhunt continues searching for Adrian Veidt the U.S. hoping to absolve itself of responsibility for the alien event as Russia insists they were willing cohorts, the political unrest spreading around the globe. In New York, looters smashed the windows of Byte International, the last paper on Adrian's desk showing that he left town and his secret was exposed. None of the other superheroes can be located either, and Rorschach's original journal had been stolen after first being deciphered and verified. Troops approach Karnak, but it is deserted as well. The release of Rorschach's information prompted the free press to be shut down in an attempt to quell the unrest, but it was too late. The troops at Karnak find a head x-ray showing a large brain lesion we can assume was taken of Adrian. The National News Network takes over broadcasting, reporting that Russia has invaded Poland, and that if Russia does not withdraw in four hours, America will respond with nuclear force. The country is under mandatory evacuation, and in a jail cell a prisoner knocks out a fleeing guard and takes his keys. Or rather, was about to take his keys when they're picked up by the new Rorschach. He asks what the man still wants out, and he wisely refuses. The title of each chapter, like the original, is a line from a quote at the issue's end, and I'll leave it to you to decide what they refer to and in what sense. The title of this first issue is That Annihilated Place, and it's pretty obvious what that means. The nuclear missile key turns in its lock as Rorschach turns his key to enter a cell block. We learn that due to a global data exchange program from the period of peace, the Russians have enough information to utterly destroy America before they could respond, thus necessitating a faster launch protocol. A preemptive strike is the only option now. Rorschach can hear the prisoners screaming to get out, most of them, but behind the cell he's opening, silence. Rorschach asks if she is Erica Manson, the villain known as the marionette. 
He tells her they have less than four hours before the prison is ashed and invites her to escape with him. She says that he told her he'd throw her down an elevator shaft if they ever met again. He tells her that was a different guy under the mask then. She demands that he prove it and he does so by removing a glove to show his black skin. She tells him he's out of his mind for dressing like that. She says that Rorschach finds him and he tells her that he is Rorschach. She asks if the rumor that Rorschach killed himself is true. He doesn't answer, but as payment for her services, he shows her a picture of a child, and from her reaction, we know it must be hers. He says if she helps him, he'll tell her where he is. She agrees, but under the condition that they also rescue her lover, Mime. They find Mime being beaten by a gang of inmates and being teased for his muteness. Marionette calls out to him as the prisoners get a glimpse of Rorschach and react with fear. She says they know he's in the middle of a performance, but they have to go. She explains to Rorschach he enjoys playing the underdog as Mime makes quick and brutal work of the five men. He indicates that he needs his weapons before they leave, and though Rorschach is reluctant, Marionette says that he won't go without him and she won't go without him, so they head for the weapons locker. Mime opens his locker and it appears empty. Rorschach says they must have cleaned him out, but he appears to pick up two invisible handguns and he stows them in his waistband. Rorschach says he has big problems. Rorschach and his two new friends escape through a hole he made in the fence and make their way to a beaten up old car from before electric became the standard. Rorschach says he doesn't trust them. They ask him questions but get few answers except when Marionette asks if he can see through his mask and he responds that he can see perfectly. Rorschach was always a character most defined by his unique perspective and it appears that is still the case. They are the only car headed into the city as the mass evacuation is underway. Loudspeakers repeat the order to evacuate as they make entry through the sewers. Rorschach leads them through a series of tunnels to Night Owl's old garage. Marionette recognizes the owl ship and asks if the rumor is true that Rorschach killed Night Owl and Silk Spectre before killing himself. Rorschach says it's false, and she then assumes he's teamed up with Night Owl. A voice from Moth Panner tells her he isn't. Ozymandias approaches with a small kitten resembling his genetically altered link Bubastis, saying he hoped to get Night Owl out of retirement but failed, but that Rorschach is working for him. Rorschach corrects him, saying he is working with Ozymandias, never for him. Marionette asks what he wants with them, and Adrian replies that he only needs her. She then threatens to kill him if he doesn't reveal her son's location, and she says the world would give her a fortune for doing so. Adrian offers her $200 million for her aid but asks that she dispense with the threats. They are not a good idea, especially with Rorschach. He says the first Rorschach was an interesting man, a cruel man in some ways, but one who held fast to his principles. He was predictable and uncompromising, but this new one is different. Rorschach shuts him up by saying that he is Rorschach and there is nothing else to tell. Adrian apologizes for upsetting him and he says he's not upset. Not yet. Marionette asks about the mission, about finding God. Adrian says that's what Rorschach calls it, and assumes she knows what he did. He says it took a lifetime to orchestrate, and for a moment, there was hope. But even the greatest empire decays. His very name is a testament to that. He had to laugh at the irony when he realized something, but he interrupts himself by clutching his head in pain. A quick news report updates us that two hours remain until the nuclear deadline, and the American reporter claims the foreign press is lying about the troops advancing in Poland. The real truth is anyone guess, but it's also irrelevant. Marionette asks what's wrong with Adrian, and Rorschach replied that he's an asshole. Adrian agrees, but says that he also has cancer. He says his cancer is spreading, another reminder of his mistakes, implying that he accidentally gave himself cancer during his plot to give Dr. Manhattan sporting cast cancer, and he likens this to the unrest devouring the globe. His dream has died, and there is no chance of saving his world anymore, even though one man has the power to, Dr. Manhattan. He said he was leaving this galaxy for one less complicated, and Adrian's mission is to find him. We see Clark Kent and Lois Lane sleeping in his Metropolis apartment in the DC Universe, and Clark is dreaming. His father is telling him they've never seen anything like him. Clark remembers his senior prom, his father making him go so he has something like a normal life. He tells Clark that one day he'll reveal himself to the world, but he's afraid of their reaction when he does. Clark's parents worry about him, but Jonathan tells Martha he's never even had a paper cut, that he can't be hurt, even as we see on Clark's face how untrue that is. Driving home, they discuss that Clark will always be alone, except that he has them, but they won't be around forever. Just then, their pickup is hit by a truck and smashes into a tree. This did not happen in regular DC continuity. Clark awakens and tells Lois about his dream, the night his parents died. Lois can't remember the last time he had a nightmare, and Clark doesn't think that he's ever had one. The title quote is another line from Ozymandias, also quoted in Watchmen. 
he meets some fragment huge and stops to guess what powerful but unrecorded race once dwelt in that annihilated place. The back pages for issue 1 are newspapers that were on Adrian's desk, dated 20 days before the story begins. The headline, The Great Lie, paired with the image of the squid alien, tells the horse's whole story, but pause and read it if you like. On the second page are various clippings, a story about the failure of nuclear disarmament, a story about the death of the New Frontiersman employee who found Rorschach's journal. Apparently he was murdered for it when it was stolen, probably by Adrian. The ad for Schrodinger's watch repair, it's a Dr. Manhattan joke, uh, most likely a dead end in Adrian's search. And Byron Lewis slash Mothman's obituary, and a breakfast menu from a diner. Marionette tells a story about a costumer for hire called the Taylor's Wife, who would set a criminal up with a costume and a gimmick for the right price. As she does, we see a security camera showing a bank robbery. She said that most of them shit their pants when encountering their first hero and threw their suits in the trash. She says that thanks to Adrian, the world has changed, not as black and white anymore. Just as the panel shifts to the black and white camera footage. The book is filled with little touches like this, so keep an eye out, or read the whole thing yourself. However well I summarize it, the real thing's always better. Adrian has given Mime and Marionette their costumes and makeup, expecting their cooperation in return. Rorschach says that he's expecting a lot, that they see the world through a warped lens. They're psychotic, sadistic, maybe masochistic, and should be closely watched, just as Rorschach is watching Adrian. Adrian says he has nothing to hide, but Rorschach replies nothing except everything, and says that Adrian is getting his hands dirty again. Adrian tells Rorschach that he sees the world as it is, and that he of all people knows you sometimes need to put your hands in the dirt. On the video, Mime imitates the scared reactions of all the tellers, and Marionette kisses the camera. Adrian says that they're all criminals now, but if they find Manhattan, they'll be the heroes again. The title of Chapter 2 is Places We Have Never Known. A bank teller presses the silent alarm. Mime catches her and smashes his head through the window, miming pointing a gun at her. Marionette picks up a picture of her child and taunts her with it. She cracks instantly and tells him the bank manager can open the safe. The manager yells that that's enough, yelling about how important their customers are. He's cut off, as well as his finger, by Marionette and her invisible slicing string. Terrified, he tells her the vault uses a hand reader. She asks which hand, and his eyes roll down to the cut one. Static electricity fills the air just before Dr. Manhattan appears, teleporting into the bank. The manager tells Marionette she picked the wrong bank, and she's in for it now. She's too busy being amazed by the floating blue man before her to respond. John points a finger at Mime, but before he can explode him, Marionette jumps in front of him, saying that John won't kill him without killing her. John hesitates, detecting the baby in her belly. Mime and Marionette are taken into custody instead of being exploded, as John usually handles criminals. Rorschach says that 37 people were killed before this point, that John has killed people for far less. Adrian says that's precisely the point. He knows John intimately, both physically and emotionally. He manipulated him into leaving Earth but now he needs to convince him to come back. Rorschach says they should have gotten Silk Spectre, and Adrian says seeing her with Dan might upset him, telling us that Dan and Laurie retired together. Marionette represents a moment in John's past that Adrian hopes to use to remind him who he was. Static fills the screen, meaning four hours are up and the nukes are in the air. With bitter irony, a man yells for everyone to look up in the sky, the words that usually precede a sighting of Superman, but this world never had a Superman, that's certainly not a bird or a plane he sees coming down on the city. Adrian says that he discovered that John's blue appearance is a result of him leaking electrons, that he's left a trail they can follow. The owl ship launches as the missile comes down. Adrian has retrofitted the owl ship for interdimensional travel, and he presses a button with Manhattan's icon on it just as the missile explodes, killing everyone in New York. The hull holds together just long enough for the travel to occur, and the owl ship shifts out of one reality and into another. Rorschach's face blurs into an inkblot image. Bruce Wayne is undergoing a psychiatric evaluation, and in every image he sees boats. He reveals that he has a friend waiting at the harbor and asks to dispense with the test. Lucius tells Bruce he needs to focus on the company and Lex Luthor's attempted stealing of his metagene research. Bruce says that Gotham needs Batman, and Lucius tells him Gotham doesn't want Batman because of the new Superman theory that no one trusts superheroes anymore. The bat isn't the symbol it used to be, it's become a disease, and protesters carry anti-bat signs in the streets. The public turning against vigilantes is meant to remind us of the Keen Act and draw a parallel between this world and Watchmen's past. 
Farouk says that it's temporary paranoia created by America's rival nations, and that Batman is necessary for the Gotham and the world. The owl ship looks a bit like a bat descending through the clouds above Gotham, and it crash lands in the same old abandoned amusement park that Joker took Barbara Gordon to in The Killing Joke, and several visuals have been replicated. Adrian recovers from the crash and awakens Rorschach. Rorschach defaults to wanting to kill Adrian until he's reminded they made a deal. Adrian calls Rorschach Reggie and tells him he's brought them to the world Dr. Manhattan fled to. Rorschach cuffs Mime and Marionette together to the owl ship before they wake up. Adrian tells him he just needs to make sure they stay put until he locates John. He retrieves Bubastis II from a compartment, telling Rorschach that she's more than a pet, she's the compass. As Adrian and Rorschach walk the streets of Gotham, an ad for a detective movie plays on TV starring Carver Coleman, who we won't meet for a while, but it will be relevant. He made the Nathaniel Dusk series of films, which garnered controversy and fame, and his murder is one of Hollywood's great unsolved mysteries. Adrian and Rorschach remark on the on-the-nose name of Gotham, and Adrian finds a library so they can learn more about this new world. Adrian finds out the biggest difference between this world and theirs is the sheer amount of costumed heroes and villains, including some who are entirely fictional in their world. Rorschach says maybe Manhattan created those, or he could be one of them. They need someone to help them navigate this world, and Adrian identifies the two smartest people on the planet, Lex Luthor and Bruce Wayne. They agree to seek them both out and explain the situation, Adrian choosing the smartest one. They arrange to meet back at the ship in 24 hours, and Adrian warns Rorschach not to interact with anyone but his target, to touch nothing. Rorschach breaks into Wayne Manor and immediately ignores his advice, deciding to eat some prepared pancakes left out. He notices the foil move on the floor, indicating a draft of air. He notices the clock and lights a match, testing to see if that's where the draft is coming from. It blows out, and he pulls back the clock, finding the entrance to the Batcave. Rorschach descends the stairs as Batman wraps up a case. He sees the image of his tied-up criminals under a street lamp, and the crook's words remind him of his visit to Arkham that day in the ink blot. and then he sees what he really saw instead of a boat, his parents lying dead in the street. Rorschach trips the Batcave's alarm, and Batman is alerted. Lex Luthor tells his staff they're all fired. A vandalized sign declares that unauthorized personnel will go missing, and Luthor says that he will end the world before he lets Wayne win. He demands to know how Adrian got into his office. Adrian says he admires Luther's taste and his aspirations, that they are the smartest men on both of their Earths. Luther goes to summon security to throw him out, but gives Adrian until they arrive to speak. Mime and Marionette find a lockpick and prepare to find a drink. Rorschach explores the Batcave, and Adrian explains his history to Luther, what he did for, or to, his world, and what happened next. Luther gives a glib analysis of Adrian's plan and his dashed hope of a lasting peace, remarking that if he is his world's smartest man, he'd hate to meet its dumbest. Adrian takes this with good humor, saying that he once shared Luther's ambitions, and offers his help in exchange for Luther's belief. In the Batcave, Rorschach forms an image of Batman from his trophies, thinking that only a monster would keep trophies like that. It's how Kovacs caught so many criminals, the tokens and prizes they kept from their victims created a trail. He doesn't know how right he is, thinking that some can't let the past go, while looking at the gun that killed Bruce's parents. He thinks of Vite like a sailor lured in by a siren, trying to relive the past, but headed only for destruction. Adrian narrowly dodges a bullet, which then hits Luther. From the shadows, the shooter accuses Adrian of coming at him when he was confused and drunk. Seeing who it is, Adrian says one word. Impossible. The comedian says that this time, he's ready. Rorschach thinks that Adrian is chasing his greatest lie, that heroes aren't already all dead. Batman accuses Rorschach of eating his breakfast, and he admits that he did. The title quote reads, We are torn between nostalgia for the familiar and an urge for the foreign and strange. As often as not, we are homesick most for the places we have never known. The back pages for issue 2 are images from the tablet in the Gotham Library, Adrian's research. One story details the Superman theory, the accusation spurred by some heroes and villains claiming the United States has been secretly creating superheroes for decades and pretending their origins are natural or accidental, and that this explains why most of the world's metahumans are found in the United States. It has sparked protest and anti-vigilante sentiment worldwide and raised the tensions between nations. In Gotham, the police have joined the anti-bat protests, Scientists have put the doomsday clock at three minutes till midnight, and a bizarre green fire has destroyed a steel mill. 
This is an indicator that this world never had a Golden Age Green Lantern, as the Green Fire is a mystery to them, but it's indicative of Alan Scott's power being used. The following story is on LexCorp's industrial espionage of Wayne Enterprises, as the two are locked in metahuman research in a new arms race. The final piece is by Lois Lane, and de details Superman's bold stance against the metahuman outrage being fueled by Lex Luthor. We see the end of the comedian's life as Adrian throws him out his own window, his body shattering the glass. He plummets toward the street, but his vision begins to black out, and he is enveloped by darkness. The title of Chapter 3 is Not Victory Nor Defeat. His vision returns, and he now sees waves beneath him, and the comedian lands safely in a body of water. He swims to shore and is greeted by Dr. Manhattan, who has teleported him from his impending death to here and now for reasons not yet known. Ozymandias and the Comedian fight as Luther bleeds out on his office floor. The Comedian punches Ozzy into a window, but only cracks. Blake laughs out loud at the look on Adrian's face, and says it's a shame it's strong glass. It wouldn't be poetic justice to throw him out the window. Adrian takes his meaning and ducks fast, cradling Bubastis too. He turns out the lights, which does not impress Eddie. He dodges a golden stiletto blade, and Adrian kicks him in the face. He says clearly John did this, and asks what he's doing here, as he continues beating Eddie. He slips in Luther's blood and misses with a chop, giving Eddie the chance he needs to backhand him away. The comedian says that people called him sick, but what he did was nothing compared to what Adrian did, and that if he killed him now, they'd give him a goddamn medal. He fires three times, hitting the window as Adrian dodges the bullet, the third grazing his head. He says that Eddie was never one for medals, and Eddie says that death changed the man, and that Adrian has nowhere to go. Adrian jumps out the window, breaking the perforated glass. He detaches his cape in mid-flip for a better aerial maneuvering, rolls down a slanted part of the building, and plants a foot on the edge. Adrian expertly flips across the street to a window washer's rig, then flips down to an awning when the rope breaks. The awning breaks and he lands on a limo. Now this does impress Eddie. In the Batcave, Batman tells Rorschach that he's trespassed into a very dangerous place. Rorschach asks if he is Bruce Wayne, and he says that he wears a mask too. He says he is not an enemy, that he is Rorschach. He attempts to explain his mission, but not very well, so he gives Batman Kovac's journal to read instead. Batman sits down to read as Rorschach waits. After a while, he asks how far Batman is, and upon learning he's only on page 4, Batman suggests he go upstairs, clean up, and get some rest. The news is covering the protesters who are demanding that Batman reveal his secret identity so they can question him about the Superman theory, the attempt to explain why 97% of the world's metahumans are American. The actor, Carver Coleman, seen as a hero by some, a deviant by others, and the old people's home is watching his movie marathon. An aged Johnny Thunder waits at the window for his grandchildren to visit, grandchildren who will never come. Because of John's changes to the timeline, there never was a Justice Society of America, and Johnny Thunder never met his magic genie, the source of his powers. Here he's just a sad old man. The Superman theory states that after Superman's arrival, which everyone believes is genuine, the American government began experimenting in secret, possibly with Superman's help, to create metahumans. Metamorpho, Manbat, and Lady Clayface have all come forward with this accusation and stories of their own experimental origins. The TV has switched to the final Nathaniel Dusk film in Carver's last role, The Adjournment, from 1954. In the film, Dusk is a broken-down detective who's lost his family and is drinking to forget them when an unexpected visitor arrives at the door on Christmas Eve when he's meant to be closed. He levels a gun as the door opens. In the darkness, he can't see his face. Back at Wayne Manor, Alfred shows Rorschach to the smallest guest room they have at his request. He compliments Alfred on the pancakes, and Al Alfred offers to make more. He leaves Reggie, telling him to make himself at home. Once alone, he unmasks, thinking of home. He showers in a bathroom worth more than the block he grew up on, feeling wrong and out of place. He compulsively scrubs his head until it bleeds, trying to clean himself of the stain of shaking hands with Vite while knowing what he did. In the Dusk film, he is investigating a double murder with no witnesses or suspects. The police have asked for his help, or rather one cop Dusk still talked to after he quit the force due to hypocrisy. The channel flips to the news, showing an explosion in Germany, reported to be an attempt to create superhumans gone awry after one of Germany's few heroes was seen fleeing the scene. Marionette and Mime have found their way to a bar called Jumping Jacks, and upon entering, they are accosted and told their makeup isn't allowed, the boss doesn't like it. They ask who that is, 
and are informed that this is the Joker's turf. Marionette asks who is the Joker? This draws more attention and disbelief. Marionette says they just want a drink, but the bouncer grabs her and threatens her with a knife. Mime mimes pointing a gun at him. He isn't scared, and doubles down on his threat. Mime pulls the trigger, and the man's head explodes backward in a spray of blood. Mime apparently has a pair of invisible guns after all. It's not too far outside the realm of possibility as the Watchmen world had a unique level of technology, but it's never explained how they work. He shoots two more attackers and then throws an invisible knife into the neck of a third, which excites Marionette. She readies her slicing string and begins lopping off parts, first half a man's head, then a gun, and then the hand holding the gun, finally taking the man's head off at the eyes. His bloody view melds into a plane on a red wine label. I think all these blending images are a motif meant to evoke the two worlds they're blending, Watchmen and the DC Universe. Mime and Marionette enjoy their drinks in peace as they have murdered every single person in the bar. They decide to go and find this Joker. The news reports that Lex Luthor is in surgery where his attacker, Adrian, remains in serious but stable condition. Many believe the assassination attempt is in response to Luthor's anti-metahuman rhetoric and his announcement of the metagene detectors. They are being installed at airports worldwide as the Middle East begins its own metahuman arms race. The channel flips back to the movie as the old folks fight over the remote. The victims were the cop's brother-in-law and his neighbor. And the detective and the cop decide they must identify who was the target and who was the victim of circumstance. As payment for his services, Nathaniel Dust requests access to his ex-wife's apartment. Her previous ex killed her and her grandparents took the kids to live elsewhere. Dusk has come back for the last thing he has left for the love of his life, a final Christmas present, still unopened. Reggie remembers the day of the squid attack. He was driving home to meet his parents when it appeared before him. When it does, he awakens with a start. Bruce Wayne is at his bedside and comforts him. He says that while Reggie slept, he read Kovac's journal and he knows where Dr. Manhattan is. Batman says that he ran a search for temporal anomalies and found one in Arkham Asylum. The guard at the asylum is also watching the adjournment, and Dusk has agreed to help through Christmas Day. The guard reveals the movie's big twist is that one of the victims was a killer as well. Rorschach and Batman sneak in on an inmate transfer truck. Rorschach notices they both use grappling guns, realizing perhaps they aren't so different after all. Batman leads Rorschach deep into the asylum, following a signal. Rorschach admires Batman's compact equipment, asking if he could spare any. Batman begins to agree when they arrive at a cell. Batman tells Rorschach that Dr. Manhattan is inside, and he rushes in, only to find words carved in the wall of the empty cell reading, We're all mad here. He turns to see Batman closing the door on him. Batman says that he's sorry, but Rorschach belongs in here. Rorschach screams, threats, and demands to be let out as Batman leaves. The title quote for Chapter 3 is by Teddy Roosevelt. Far better is it to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much, because they live in a gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. The back pages for Chapter 3 are a Hollywood tabloid featuring the murder of Carver Coleman. No date is given, but from contact, I believe it is 1954. The details given are that Carver Coleman, after celebrating the completion of the adjournment with friends, went home and was found killed the next morning, beaten to death with his own film award, in a parallel to the murder of Hollis Mason. The only thing missing was a watch he always wore, given to him by his parents the day he left home. The tabloid goes on to reveal that Coleman had a shocking secret hidden in his past, as the police were unable to locate the farm or the parents he claimed to have. They then found a secret room in Coleman's house, the walls filled with clocks and his watch collection. In a desk in that room was a letter from a woman claiming to be Carver's mother, attempting to blackmail her son for money, but she disappeared shortly after, leaving the police once again clueless. His films are described briefly, and the controversy was mostly due to using words like virgin and abortion, depicting drug use, and a director who was labeled as a communist. We also learn that Carver arrived in Hollywood in 1928 and delivered mail until his first role in 1930. The final page is mostly Easter eggs, the first bullet point detailing the birth of Rita Farr, later a member of the Doom Patrol. The second deals with men who should be in the JSA but aren't, like boxer Ted Grant and a conspiracy around the death of Sergeant Rock, a DC World War II character. The final piece clears Carver's screenwriter of his murder. He was in the drunk tank at the time. Rorschach is in Arkham Asylum, and he shows us his ability to see what he wants to see, a coping mechanism he has developed. He remembers being bullied as a child and never fighting back because he never saw himself as a fighter. A tiger-faced man offers him protection in exchange for being his property. 
spurred by a shape in the fur, he remembers he was five years old the first time he saw a mushroom cloud. It was a nuclear test televised by Leonard Brezhnev in direct response to Dr. Manhattan's entrance into the Vietnam conflict. We now learn that Reggie is in fact Reggie Long, the son of the doctor who interviewed Walter Kovacs, who lost his faith in humanity and then died in the squid attack. Reggie's mom wants to move, but Malcolm Long is convinced his career is in New York until he begins writing books. Reggie was an only child, a good boy, who avoided trouble, but had average grades and was antisocial. As Rorschach is dragged, kicking and screaming back to his cell, he spits out a large chunk of skin with fur still attached. Reggie remembers being in college and hearing the editor of the New Frontiersman asking if we shouldn't reevaluate Rorschach as a patriot and American, and about his father having his first interview with Kovacs. His father told him everyone was searching for enlightenment, for meaning, for purpose. That was before he met Walter Kovacs. Reggie's on the phone with his mom. The students are protesting the use of Manhattan in Vietnam, but all he cares about is his father. He's worried about him. He's read disturbing things about Rorschach, but his mother assures him the papers have it all wrong, that his father's making progress, and that he and Walter are becoming friends. When we see her face, we know that she's lying. Kovacs would have saved his father's career, but the world went to hell and Rorschach escaped. We're back on the street during the squid bomb, we learn that Reggie saw his parents die in the blast of energy when it hit. Back in Arkham, Reggie screams again to be let out while restrained in a chair. The doctor assigned to him enters the room, has heard that Reggie's first day has been rough. Reggie says he doesn't want to talk to the doctor. He says that Reggie has no match for fingerprints, dental records, or DNA. That all they really know is that Batman brought him in. He asks about Batman, but Reggie is busy hallucinating an alien eye in the doctor's forehead. He has bad memories of being locked up. We see him still screaming in his car as police clean up after the attack. Reggie's one of the many people who survived but with severe mental trauma from the incident. Asylums overflowed with the glut of madness Adrian unleashed. A pregnant woman cut out her own fetus, believing it was eating her. A man cut off his legs because he wanted to be like the creature. Reggie tried to gouge out his eyes to stop seeing the dead. Uncontrolled violence during the days, tortured screaming at night, Every time he shut his eyes, he saw them coming for him. He nearly broke his arm, escaping the straitjacket. The pain on top of the grief was unbearable. He had to escape it. Reggie makes it to the roof and is about to leap off the edge when he sees a man up there already on the edge and clothed in a sheet who calmly greets him. Reggie asks the man if he's jumping too. The man says no, he's not jumping. He can fly. They said he couldn't, but with long, hard work, he discovered the secret of flight is visualization. He sees what he wants to see. And then what he sees is what is. And with that, he steps off the edge of the roof. Byron Lewis, a.k.a. Mothman, takes flight into the night sky on wings made from materials from the asylum. The title of Chapter 4 is Walk on Water. Reggie is astounded into calmness and is taken back to his cell. Reggie is being given a Rorschach test. He doesn't want to look, but the alternative is more shock therapy. He sees his parents' bodies lying in the street. The doctor explained that they thought the probability of the aliens returning is very low, but they fear that those people affected may have become sleeper agents in preparation for a second attack, so it's important that they understand what's going on in his mind for more than just his own sake. Reggie remembers Byron's words about visualization, and he's able to see an image he can bear to view. He says he sees a moth. Mothman flew to a diner in town wearing nothing but his wings. Byron and Reggie watch Adrian on TV speaking from a historic meeting with the President Gorbachev. He says that both the U.S. and the Soviet Union are committed to helping rebuild Afghanistan, which the Russians had invaded and occupied before the squid bomb hit. Byron tells Reggie that he used to be a superhero, the Minuteman Mothman. Back in Arkham in the present, the doctor asks Reggie who he thinks he is and why he thinks Batman put him there. He judges the doctor to be bloated and arrogant, nothing like his father. Like Kovacs before him, he has idealized and strived to live up to a fiction of his father, the way he'd like him to be, having never really known the man he actually was. As he has walked past the cells of Arkham, Reggie wonders who, if anyone, Dr. Manhattan could be. He's placed back in his cell across from another unidentified person. He hears voices in his cell, and when he shuts his eyes, he still sees brains oozing out of ears and bodies in the street. But now he can change it to what he wants to see. His parents, happy and alive. Reggie remembers Byron teaching him how to visualize past his trauma. He asks if Reggie has anything of theirs like a photograph, but Reggie has nothing as his neighborhood is quarantined. 
Byron offers to fly to New York, asking only for sheets and bed springs for the wings. Over the years, he would make a habit of this, bringing in contraband such as candy and current magazines. One night, Byron brought Reggie everything from his father's desk. Reggie reads his father's interview notes with Kovacs. Reggie and Byron are missing a puzzle piece, both literally and figuratively, as Reggie says that most of his father's notes are missed, no doubt taken by Byron to spare him the pain of a broken illusion. Reggie is assaulted by an orderly for having his father's mug, which is broken in the scuffle. Byron apologizes, blaming himself for the incident. Reggie asks him if he knows how hard it is having all that anger inside him with nowhere to go. Byron says he was never primarily a fighter, but he'd learned a lot watching the other men and men, and in Reggie he sees a fighter. Byron trains Reggie to fight, mixing the styles of all the men and men together. The next time that orderly tries to push around someone weaker than him, Reggie knocks him on his ass with one punch. The news reports that Adrian Veidt is unexpectedly absent from the public eye amid criticism for his words at Sally Jupiter's memorial, his opinion that maybe she didn't deserve a statue as she wasn't particularly smart or moral. Byron tells Reggie that all the people affected, like him, are being rounded up and questioned about Adrian, so we can assume the investigation into his scheme is well underway. Reggie attacks an orderly with a fork, and soon given another Rorschach test. When asked what he sees in the same ink blot in which the first Rorschach saw the dog's head, he replies that he sees Rorschach. It's October 11, 1992, about ten days before the end of the world. The news is finally broken and Adrian's scheme is revealed to the world. Reggie says that everything has changed now that he has someone to blame. Byron asks what if he didn't do it, but Reggie is utterly convinced of his guilt. Reggie starts a fire while Byron hits the alarm and they escape in the chaos. Byron stops to look back though, fascinated by the flames. Byron tells Reggie that the light has been calling to him. He says he can see it. Reggie asks what he sees, but gets no answer. Byron drops his coat and extends his wings one final time and the Mothman is drawn into the flames. Reggie didn't understand. Not until later. He reads a letter Byron has left for him along with a ticket Adrian had once given him to the Antarctic. He has a map, a clipping about Karnak, and supplies for the journey. Byron asks Reggie to forgive him for not coming with him, but his path lay elsewhere. He asks Reggie to remember him as they first met on the roof so he can smile at the memory. He says that Reggie has always been searching for his true north, his direction in life. He prays that Reggie finds the truth he seeks, and that what brought them together could be random chance or a great design, but the truth is relative, and all that matters is what he sees. Reggie finds Byron's final gift, a Rorschach mask. Reggie says that the first time he held the mask, it smiled at him. He takes the ship to the Antarctic and treks across the frozen wasteland. Reggie makes it to Karnak, and the scooter Rorschach didn't take back to the owl ship is still there by the entrance, buried in snow. He enters and makes his way past the monitor room. Reggie sees Adrian, picks up a scalpel, and prepares to kill him. Adrian turns and asks that he make it quick, whoever he is. It's obvious that he's not Kovacs, and he can't imagine he was a friend of his. Reggie says that he is Rorschach. Adrian offers him comfort and aid and reveals that he has discovered a brain tumor, one that he would only trust himself to operate on. Adrian knows why he's here, because of what he did, the mistake he made. Rorschach tells Adrian he killed his parents, that he inflicted untold mental suffering on millions, most who committed suicide in horrible ways, but that he has stayed, he has fought and survived, all for this, and he puts the scalpel to Adrian's throat. Adrian tells him to go ahead and do it, to make the world cheer and celebration. He wanted them to see a monster, but now he knows that he is the monster. He says that he's sorry, that he saw the light too late. Rorschach sees the regret and pain in his eyes, and he drops the scalpel to the floor. Back in Arkham, Reggie hears that voice again, but this time it's coming from the cell across the hall. Jane Doe says that she's been in his mind for a few days, and it's a busy place. She says they have to get out of there, as she won't be around much longer. Reggie asks who she is, and she answers, a friend. Reggie remembers Mothman, as he was in his prime, and his father's words about searching for enlightenment. He says that people are drawn to it, like bugs to a light. Reggie thinks that his father was a good man helping troubled people, like Kovacs, and like himself. He thinks that he pulled them out of the darkness and into the light. Adrian tells Reggie they can still save the world, but they can't do it alone, as they depart Karnak. Searchlights scour Arkham, but Rorschach and the Mystery Girl have already escaped. In the Batcave, 
Batman says that he underestimated Reggie, and he puts away his doctor disguise. Alfred agrees and reminds Bruce that he told him that he wouldn't have let someone like that alone in Arkham. He knows too much, and they don't know enough. Rorschach wonders, what is the light? It's different for everyone, but everyone is looking, seeing what they want to see, no matter how small or how big they are. A mosquito flies into the bug zapper and leaves behind a smoke trail in the shape of Dr. Manhattan's icon. The title quote from Chapter 4 is from Lin Ji Yuan. The miracle is not to walk on water. The miracle is to walk on Earth. The back pages for Issue 4 are a series of letters Byron wrote to his sister while in the asylum beginning in 1962 and going up to 1992. At first she does not reply as his exposure as a superhero and subsequent commitment have caused his family great shame and embarrassment. He reminisces about their childhoods, he shares his grief at the death of a friend, he writes her a letter a week for over ten years with no reply. In 1985 she finally does reply in the wake of the worldwide tragedy. He soon after writes about meeting Reggie and finding a new purpose in life to help this young man. In the final letter, written the day of the escape, he says that he will love her forever, but he's going to join their father and mother. He says that they have finally forgiven him. He saw them, and one day he'll see her again too.